So how would you, just today, not some definition that you're committing to forever, how would you define serverless? Um, I say that serverless is stateless um, architecture for stateless applications. Mm -hmm. That's so, very catchy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of um, like it. <laughs> right? You, you can't build a serverless application, at least not today, that isn't stateless. Uh, and also, if you're looking at building a stateless application, it's a good candidate towards moving to a, a serverless, serverless paradigm. But you need these applications that aren't writing local state into the file system, for instance. You need, you know, like, let's say a microservice, a web API that talks to a database, right, mm -hmm. that's running on another system, such as RDS in the case of AWS. One of my colleagues, Rachel Stevens, actually kind of came up with her, her definition of, of serverless as managed services that yeah. scale to zero. So just kind of like that, but with like another component. Yeah, I think I, one of the one of the reason being is that the um, there isn't really a point to like narrowing down the idea mm -hmm. of serverless because whole point like whole point back to the where the the ideal world that developer could just focus on writing business logic and they don't care, have to care mm -hmm. about any other things. Do you have any kind of like best practices or training paths or tips for um, you know people who want to kind of learn to start coding in the serverless space? Back in South Korea actually, mm -hmm. um, the concept of serverless is pretty, pretty new thing and then so anytime yeah. we recruit somebody in our company they are totally new about the concept mm -hmm. so I need to teach them. I always start from just like so we have this we have this um, template so you could just download it and you just change the name of the um, app and you could just deploy it and you mm -hmm. have a serverless API server. It works well, but like it's almost too easy so that people kind of get confused about what they're doing. Like mm -hmm. I know this makes sense, but like people are like, oh, so you just need to type this and then enter it. You made a server, and they're like, oh. So this is a server, right? Like, so do I need to do something? And then like, no, it's just serverless thing. So actually, um, I find it like practically explaining what, like practically explaining how to use it is pretty easy. Mm -hmm. But like, like people to really understand what it is is quite, still quite complicated. Um, and it takes some time, I think. Yeah. Erica, have you had any um, kind of insights into some best practices? Ultimately, I see serverless as being, um, when you're building a serverless application, it's not just stateless, it's also a distributed application. Mm -hmm. And you need to know how to build distributed applications. And that's a paradigm that a lot of developers just aren't familiar with. Yeah. Like building these highly distributed, loosely coupled applications that work through messaging buses and mm -hmm. everything right. is something I'm very familiar with. But a lot of developers have never worked with the message queue, and people aren't necessarily thinking of things in terms of distributed applications, especially if you're coming from the EC2 virtual machines, Docker, Kubernetes world, mm. um, because those systems don't. Ha I love this idea of serverless provides um, enough constraints and challenges that you're forced along this path to building applications a certain way. That's mm -hmm. really true. Um, in things like Kubernetes, for instance. You can build applications that are highly distributed or deeply centralized and monolithic. Mm -hmm. And if you're using Kubernetes and you're building those monolithic apps, then it's going to be harder if you're using Kubernetes and building distributed, scalable, you know, cloud native apps. And you know, that's one of the main problems I see with platforms like Kubernetes is they give you too much power to do things um, maybe not according to what I would consider best practices. So going back to the serverless, so if you want to do a serverless, you need to understand how to build a loosely coupled microservices or to like know how to make a distributed system. So a guy sitting right next to me in my back in office is born in 2000. So he literally joined the company after having like some experience in the like front end programming. So I've like, so now I'm telling, telling like um, teaching him how to do like cloud thing. And then, and then he, he like when I told, when I first told him like serverless whatever, and then like he would first his first response was like, why do I need to do it? Like why can not I just spin up the Docker image or something? And I, I, so I have so I've gone so far explaining like if we go scale into like hundred times, you have to you have to spend so much time on DevOps. So we should start from serverless. And then that kind of a. Uh, uh, Insights, I would say it's very like hard to wrap around for a lot of yeah. developers. 
Um, and then I'm, I'm coming from a background having like a, a massive traffic for our B2C users. But like a lot of people working in a B2B space or like a small users, they don't really have to deal with this massive scalability and all that. So for, for those people, I find it really hard to actually um, like explain the inevitability of serverless. Mm -hmm. yeah. The inevitability of serverless. I kind of like that phrase. I, I think we we're going to talk about this too, but like I really believe that that's it's kind of inevitability that mm -hmm. every application we're going to build on from now is going to go into serverless um, area. Mm -hmm. So I've, at, I, anytime I meet new, new developers, I try to explain like this going to, this is how future is going, so you should do it. Yeah. yeah, I think there's a space for applications, you know, even long term that are not serverless. Um, that are explicitly designed not to scale. Mm -hmm. um, if you need an application that will ever at any point scale, you should be building it on serverless and you should That's be true. building, you know, this distributed architecture, right? You know, and dealing with the, you know, the challenges and the fact that, like, say, you don't have storage, you you use mm -hmm. HTTP APIs for your storage, mm -hmm. you use S3. But these applications that don't scale, I mean, for things like your Apple Watch, right? Like, <laughs> you know, yeah. if, if you have a smartwatch, it's never going to scale to millions of instances. Right, right. It's a watch. Now, I think the idea of, you know, uh, functions as code, you know, things like green grass are really mm -hmm. compelling and interesting uh, um, on IoT. Mm -hmm. uh, the, app, the idea that you can take application architecture and run it anywhere mm -hmm. is interesting. And even things like mobile and um, IoT devices do interact with the cloud. So to that degree, it does make some sense to use the same development paradigm, but ultimately, if you're building an you know a native local application for a phone or a watch, like it doesn't have to be serverless. It's not scaling in that way. Mm -hmm. It's the backend services that right. it talks to. Yeah. definitely need to be serverless. So I do th I do think there's that's kind of true, but also these days I kind of think of it as like, so one other thing that people doesn't really understand is that the, uh, if you go to serverless, it's not just that you don't have to scale by manually. Mm -hmm. It also lets you, your team and yourself move so much faster. Mm -hmm. That's another thing that a lot of people doesn't think of, um, think about, I think. So uh, honestly, I would, I would do it in serverless because of that, because I, I could <laughs> deploy so much mm -hmm. easily, um, which, is not the, which is not serverless, serverless thing, but like a lot of serverless platforms goes into direction where deployments or monitoring and scaling are so much easier than the yeah. non-serverless platforms. Well, so. and I think the big thing here versus traditional architectures is that traditional architectures have infrastructure. And with serverless, mm -hmm. there is zero infrastructure. Yeah, like it, it's implicit infrastructure in most cases. Um, and of course, there are things still like potentially VPCs and so forth that you can optionally opt into. But like all together, like the way that we build and deploy applications at IO Pipe is like let's say it's a Node.js, it's a serverless um, function written in Node.js. There's a package.json mm -hmm. and a serverless at YAML because we use a serverless framework. And you know, when we uh, commit to Git and we merge something, um, the CI/CD runs. Mm -hmm. You know, the packaging process executes and it deploys into Lambda. And we're not dealing with Terraform and Puppet and Chef and all of these things. Mm -hmm which totally makes sense when you're deploying, you know, complicated infrastructure that needs to be, co you know, correlated and like, you know, like there, there's an orchestration problem, right? Yeah. And I don't have the orchestration problem with serverless. It's just, you know, Application. deploy it. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's very interesting to hear it because our company does the exactly same thing. Like, we just, uh, each, each project has a package JSON and we almost and you just push it, and automatically deploy it. Um, actually, one, one, one thing, funny thing, one funny thing was anytime I brought some other people from other bigger company or other companies and showed them that, they actually like very, like, I would say, very like surprised, I guess. Mm -hmm. The fact that if you just, you could just deploy application that easily. Like, they're <laughs> like, they don't understand the concept that deployment could happen in like two minutes, like in one minute or even. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are still a company that doesn't deploy, if it's Friday, they don't, they don't deploy it because they cannot roll back fast enough. One thing that we've seen a lot at Red Monk, um, people have been talking about, well, serverless is, is one thing we're hearing about, but another one is, is observability. Mm -hmm. And one of the kind of tenets that we've been heard over and over again is that it's difficult to do that with something like serverless. Tell me your thoughts on observability and serverless. Mm -hmm. So um, my approach to this has been, um, and of course, IO pipes as well. 
that which is my company mm -hmm. um is that we are not infrastructure observability we are mm -hmm. application observability mm -hmm. so we want you to to help developers and operators understand not what the infrastructure is doing not what the you know cpu and, and memory looks like necessarily although we, we do collect some of that um, the value is in understanding what is my application doing what is it talking to so if it's you know if there's traces like what services do am i talking to um, what errors am i getting um, in those http call those api calls or maybe i i submit the thing i got no error and it's just not showing up, right? A record's mm -hmm. not showing up um, that should have occurred in a database entry or something. And we can go in and say, well, okay, you know, or they can go into their console and see, okay, this is the order number, and they can go into the individual invocation, invocation. Um, which was, you know, a, a node function, um, basically mm -hmm. a block of node code that execute it and handle the HTTP requests, and then see everything that happened as an artifact of the HTTP request that came into their application, including any HTTP calls they made or database mm -hmm. inserts or anything, and then tie that all together into a story. Um, and it's all application level. And so yeah. little of this is infrastructure, right? Because sure. serverless doesn't have infrastructure, or it does, but it's <laughs> like, you know, it's serverless. We don't care about the infrastructure. I think it's kind of, uh, it's one of those things that people doesn't under like people doesn't call up to the paradigm shift. Like if you go to serverless, op like the word of the meaning of the word observability yeah. changes. So like you're perfectly right about like yeah, all you need to do you all you need to be able to monitor is like application mm -hmm. and actually reduce of work because at the mm -hmm. time in a Docker or something you need to be able to monitor the hardware and infrastructure and the application. It's all different mm -hmm. level and then you have to be able to do all of that and all that is observability. But like if you come to serverless, you just don't need to do those. So you're, yeah. you're not losing ability. You're just that you don't have to do it anymore. But like a lot of people doesn't get that. Mm -hmm. They kind of like get frustrated because, for example, like they don't like. Uh, I actually heard a lot of people saying like, where should I? Where can I see the CPU usage? Or like, <laughs> where can I see like memory usage by container? But like, it, I mean, the whole point of serverless is that you don't have to worry about those things. So we're Final question, where do you see serverless going in say like the next five to 10 years? And where do you want to see serverless go? Can't ignore the fact that we're gonna presume that something comes after it, after mm -hmm. right? right. Yeah. And is that thing built on top of serverless? Is that thing a, pl a new platform for serverless? Is it a completely new paradigm? So to me, the way that I'm understanding the advancement of technology is that the, uh, I think, uh, I think 2017 in a reinvent, um, CTO of Amazon did a, a keynote, and he actually showed showed this uh, slide saying, uh, "All the all the logic you ever wrote is business logic." Like that's the idea yeah. they had. Mm -hmm. and I think that's where technology is going. Like all the dockers and all the open stack, the way all the things we're building now is to get to get there, where mm -hmm. a lot of developers just need to write a business logic, and then all, they don't have to care about any other things. So in that, like if we understand technology in that sense, I think we're get we almost got there. Like we're very close from there. At this point, I. I just don't care about it. I only <laughs> care about making the distributed architecture. As long as that's right, you don't have to care about it. You only need yeah. to care about business logic. So I do feel like I, it might be kind of end in a sense that mm -hmm. as of like this way of adv advancement, like mm -hmm. all you need to do is just writing business logic. Yeah. Um, one other, uh, that's where I see serverless in the 10 years. Everybody just doing, yeah. writing application in serverless and nobody even talks about like building up the east to whatever. But um, but I think after that, what could happen is that you already see from some company doing it is that the uh, even more componentized um, applications, mm -hmm. such as like even Amazon doing this similar thing, which is um, people just, people don't even write application logic. Yeah. They actually just reuse the component that's already mm -hmm. built with the infrastructure ready mm -hmm. and just plug it in. So mm -hmm. you even you even even less business logic basically. Yeah, yeah I, I actually agree. Um, so when I was first starting IO Pipe, um, the original premise before we realized the observability was um, a much better and effective and timely wedge, um, we had experiment with some prototypes around building reusable components, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and the idea was 
than not just could we have reusable components. But when we get to a point of you know, a serverless world, when we don't have to worry about the infrastructure side and the code defines the requirements of infrastructure mm -hmm. and we have reusable components, at what point can we use machine learning to mm. compose those components in a way where developers are no longer writing new code?